What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks. DJ back in the uh, saddle here. Bucky is out, but that just gives me a good opportunity. Say hello to my good friend, Lance Zerline. Lance, how you doing, bud? We say, DJ, I missed you at the uh, the big uh, content summit. You were on a, a cruise, or I don't know, you were doing something with the family. Have you been out? How long have you been out? What have you been doing? No, I, I've I've been back since then. So I, I uh, came back in, and I've been out, hit a bunch of training camps, and uh and oh yeah, I had, that's right. I had to miss the one earlier this week because I was not too far from you driving my son back to Baylor uh, yeah. for his sophomore year. So uh, got his his uh, car dropped off there. His year two, you know, they get off campus, Lance. We got to get into the apartment, and uh, you know, it's funny. Like you look in there, and uh, you think back to when you're a kid. Like he's like, "This is great. It's a big apartment. There's five guys. You know, they got four bedrooms. It's big. It's you know, big place there in Waco." And I'm just looking up there. I'm like, golly, that looks definitely like some water damage up there. That's <laughs> definitely some mold issues going on around were here. You able to, <laughs> were, you, were you able to experience uh, the heat dome 2023, what we're calling heat dome, where it's it's this incredible heat that won't move. We've we've been over 100 degrees for like 25 oh. straight days. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it, it it has been pretty hot in East County here in San Diego, where I live. Has and- it? And, you know, I'm not, not above complaining a little bit about heat. And then uh, I drove to get the drove the car. And as we're kind of getting through New Mexico, entering into Texas, I mean, mind you, uh, Arizona was not a uh, wasn't blustery in, uh, in Arizona part of that drive. But then we get into Texas. It was triple digits and it was uh, a little sticky, a little sticky. Yeah, out there. it's a triple digits with humidity is a different. It's a completely different. It's oppressive and it's not very fun. It's kind of funny because. The Miami Houston Texans are having a joint practice with Miami, and a couple of the Miami beat writers are like, "This is bad even for us." And you know, mm-hmm. we're in Miami, where it's hot and sticky, but this is really bad. You know, it's funny. D'Amico Ryan's doesn't have Houston has access to an indoor practice facility, but it's amazing how many teams don't use indoor practice facilities early on because they want to. I want you to feel that they want to yeah. act. They want you to acclimate to this this weather, even though Houston plays indoors. Did um by the way, did you get Walt Coleman to sign your hat or are you still waiting on that? <laughs> it's I got my new NFL hat in the mail, and I'd like I'm I'm holding out for uh oh what's his name with the guns, the famous oh hockey league. Yeah, yeah I'm waiting for Ed Hockey League to uh to sign this. Of course, He's all of them have now. guns. His son now. now is is uh his son's yeah. on the team, but uh yeah, it's very much. If you can't, you're listening to us. You can't see it. Lance basically looks like a line judge right now with this hat it's that he's got on. Pretty much exactly the same, actually. Now that I look at it. Yeah, yeah. it's Rob Blow's hat with just a little, little more color. A little yeah, bit. snap back. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's nice. I'm um, ready. I'm ready to go. All right, here we go. Here's what we're doing today. We are going to hit a couple topics off the top, including uh, an, an alarm that you should have in the preseason. We're gonna we're gonna fill you in on that. We're gonna also talk about this rookie tight end class, which has a chance to be really good. A lot of early uh, reviews in on this group. I think you're gonna see a lot of these guys starting. A lot of them, you know, playing big minutes. The question is, what is reasonable to expect from that group? So we'll hit on that. Um, we're also going to go through and discuss a little bit about what Rance, Lance wrote about on NFL.com, uh, talking about some pivotal rookies. You did it for all 32 teams. We'll just take one per division and uh, okay. and get a chance to, to touch on those guys. Guys, you're looking for big things this year. But I want to start out here, Lance. Preseason, I almost tweeted it out. I, I say it every year. Preseason is a liar. So everything with a chunk of salt, not a, not a grain of salt here. Just be careful drawing any massive conclusions here with what you see in the preseason. And the one thing that clouds it more than anything else is this league for decades now has been much deeper on the defensive side of the ball up front than it has been on the offensive side of the ball up front. And you have the, you know, a lot of these mainstay offensive linemen, they're not playing in these preseason games. So you can come out of the preseason and think, man, we have got the best defensive line in the history of football. Or you can come out of this preseason saying, we are not going to be able to block a soul. Our quarterback's going to get killed. And I would caution either one of those extreme opinions at this point in time. I would too. Um, we lived we lived at the first preseason game with the Houston Texans because they had, you know, Laramie Tunsil didn't play. You've got your right tackle, Titus Howard, is out with an injury and, and may actually miss a couple of a couple of games to start the season. And then you have Scott Questenberry, the starting center last year, out, uh, who was out, you know, who's out for the year, really bad knee injury. Questenberry played well last year, I thought. And so now you have Questenberry's a big Padre fan, by the way. We used to talk about is that it on, really? the, on the plane. Yep. 
I know a UCLA guy, but very athletic. Thought he would have been a nice fit here. Um, I think Juice Scruggs was going to be maybe battling Kenyon Green actually for for reps at left guard. And then what happened was Juice Scruggs had to slide over to center. Um, you had a you had Austin Deculus, who was a, a seventh yeah, round pick of the Texans. Tough, tough outing for Austin in that week one. I watched that tape. Yeah, it was rough. I had him as a <laughs> I had him as a fifty five mm-hmm. coming out. So I did I did not think he was an NFL player even a practice squad guy personally. And I, you know, I certainly hope he plays well with the Texans. They're missing Charlie Heck, their normal swing tackle. So you had a bunch of backups basically playing and then CJ Stroud just couldn't, he didn't have time. I mean, he didn't have time in that offense where he's learning to read through progressions. He's learning a new offense and they were already, Oh boy, Ooh, this sure didn't look good. And all I can think of was golly guys. I mean, we really have to, you have to take a step back and just slow yourself. Same thing with Bryce Young. Bryce Young. Bryce Young had seven dropbacks and got walloped on three of them. Got right, absolutely and, crushed. I think on he had three pressure on five of his seven, yeah. I guess, and he got hit hard on three of them. Yeah. So, I mean, for those two guys, that doesn't even count. And that's a yeah. great example of what you're talking about. Once depth becomes an issue, once you get to the depth part, you already are overmatched a lot of times starting offensive line versus starting defensive line. I would say there's more defensive lines that would that would be considered better than the offensive lines in this league if you look at all 32 teams with matchups. And then when you go uh, – now when you start taking some starters off the offensive line, even if you take equal oh. starters off the defensive line, it's night and day. The backups are legitimate. They're rotational players mm-hmm. on the defensive line in many cases. That's not the case with the offensive line. There's not as many rotational offensive linemen. Yeah, like none. I mean, like none. ideally, you're throwing your five out there, and you're hoping, yeah. you're praying that they stay healthy. If and you're they doing run it, out there it's not a good back. sign. Typically, if you have a rotational yeah. guard, we see that from time to time. That's typically not a good sign. No, and so it, to me, it just it, it muddies the picture a little bit. So uh, again, don't don't draw sweeping conclusions when you watch these preseason games. Look for little little signs of hope. Look for some good things here and there that you see, uh, and don't get too carried away because we have seen plenty of teams look gangbusters in the preseason, and you think they're the deepest team in the NFL, and then you realize when you get into the regular season, those you know those 22 at the top of the list, those are the ones that, that matter. Forget teams for a second. What about players? What are your thoughts on that? Because you've been in different camps, and you've seen this. You've done this job for a while. What about players? I typically find players who get off to a good start individually, they do have a chance to actually have it translate, but it also depends on which units they're going against um, defensively. It's good on good. It's good on good. When you see, like I was at Steelers, and I saw Darnell Washington in one-on-one drills with T.J. Watt more than hold his own, win, win as many as he lost. And this is in pass protection, you know, so you're seeing that. And then you're seeing how competitive he is when they get into the team periods. I'm like, okay, he's, he's going to be fine. Like that's, I can draw, that's, that's an all pro. That's one of the best players. Or a receiver, because, you know, my thought was as a blocker. He's see, you know, my thought was that in the future, he could be a tackle. He could be a tackle. In the future, I wonder, I definitely wonder how big did he look? I heard he's measured Uh, in at 260 something. Did he look like that to you? higher higher so so i will say this i will say this i will say this on a i would put my hand on the on the on the stack of bibles and tell you that he is closer to 290 than he is to 275 really he's huge oh well because he's he's, he can still move and he's not fat it's good nine percent body fat at 270 pounds it just it it just lance don't even say it i will i'm telling you on my mortgage he does not weigh in the 270s he's in the okay so the reason i the reason i say this i think our our editor i think there was a time where he wasn't sure i don't know what the piece was that i wrote but it may have been the draft profile you sure we want to add this about offensive tackle and I said, yes, I don't care if I take heat for it because he's a player who has the frame that could he could literally grow into a 310 pound player. I mean, he has here's that kind of he frame. Weighed, here's what he weighed the day I was there. I'm putting it in the chat, but you can't say it. Okay. You see in the chat here? You looking? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. not an F. That's not an no. F tight end. No, that is not Chris Cooley. Um, and he looked great, didn't he? He looked good. He looked good. But anyways, to get to the back on track like that, seeing good on good, you draw conclusions from that. I remember when I was with the Ravens a million moons ago, uh, Terrell Suggs, first one-on-one rep, went against Jonathan Ogden and beat him. 
Now he might not have beat Jo the whole rest of the camp, but that first one, you're like, okay, you can beat if you can beat him, you can beat anybody. Like th this is somebody that's that's it's going to work. It's going to translate to the next level. Those are the things you're trying to glean, and that's going to happen in these joint practices more uh, more so than anything else. Yeah, I think that you know I love the idea of joint practices. I think they do need to stay under control, and you don't want anything to. You know, you Are know you saying this as an analyst or as an official right now? I don't know. I, I don't okay, know. so as an analyst, and if I take off my my side judge hat for a second, um, I think it's fine to have – it's more competitive. I think the practice time you get is more competitive. We know we've gone to three preseason games. I actually would be fine with preseason games because I think – and this just comes from being a coach's son. You know, my dad had issues uh, with not being able to get – quote unquote, hands on linemen for true technique work as much as, you know, with every collective bargaining agreement, there's fewer and fewer practices, fewer padded practices. And so he really uh, missed that because he didn't think they had a chance to to teach technique as much as as maybe he wanted to. And so I, I don't know. I think the three games are important now, less for getting starters ready less than ever before so, so and more for let, GMs let, getting a look right. Let me let me uh, run this by you. So I was talking to a GM about this the other day because we were talking about gosh, it's not it's just for a fan. It's not a great right. experience coming to these preseason games, right? So we were we were kind of going back and forth on something. This is what we came up with and said, okay, this could be something where everybody gets what they want. You come out, you come to the stadium, you get starters seven on seven. So I'm seeing the the stars of these teams, you know, seven on seven, the skill guys. So you go seven on seven for Are we pads. Minutes. Yeah, you can be shorts. You can be shorts and shoulder pads for those okay. guys. Whatever you want to do, you can be full padded up. Doesn't matter. But no, there's no not no thud. It's all tag off. We're gonna get a little bit of seven on seven with the front line guys. Then after that's over, we're gonna have a move the ball scrimmage with mm -hmm. your twos and threes, whoever you need to get a look at. And we're gonna play. You know, say it's uh, a half. You know, maybe it's two full quarters. And then you're also while you know while the seven on seven is going on. On the other end of the field, you have the front line offense and defensive linemen doing one on ones. So they're getting a chance to go up against different rushers. You're getting a chance to see different tackles. You're getting a chance to kind of hone your craft against different guys. It's senior bowl practice. It's a senior bowl practice. It's more of a controlled environment. And the only difference would be that when you get to the move the ball session, that's going to be the younger guys. We get a chance to evaluate some of these younger players. But as a fan, I mean, you tell me I get to, the, I do the Charger games. You tell me I get to go. I've got Chargers Saints. So I'm going to go to see Herbert and Carr in seven on seven for a little bit. And then they're going to, you know, put the, uh, you know, put the backups in and move the ball. I would rather watch that than to go out there and watch the backups for four full quarters. I love the idea. I love the idea of a scrimmage. Um, I've always felt like, you know, if, if the, if the XFL or world or not world league, but um, USFL or whoever, I've always felt like a minor league, you could become a true minor league if it was less about selling tickets and playing games and it was more of a controlled scrimmage to where yeah. you're putting things on tape for NFL teams to take a look at. Um, or, you know, even if practice squad guys were able to play in a, in a, in a concurrent league uh, that was adjacent to the NFL season. So I, I do like that idea because it's, it is less, less opportunity for injury, at least through physical contact. You can, there's nothing you can do about non-contact injuries. Um, yeah, I like the idea. I mean, I like senior bowl practices. I do like the fact that we can move around. So I think you'd have to, yeah. you know, you'd have to move things for the fans to be able to see differently. But I actually do. I like that idea a lot. And I think you could start by having joint practices starting on a, you know, a Wednesday. And, and that mm -hmm. week you get up to the preseason game and it's just a continuation of the joint practices. I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, we can go on the marketing side of things, too. If you wanted to do it where it's two days you spend with a team and it's basically the function of the joint practices like they're doing now. Most of these teams spend two days. So we'll, we'll put both those days inside the stadium. And then guess what? Outside the stadium, we'll have NFL fan experience. You want to go out there and they'll have all the games and food and all that kind of set up and almost kind of make it like uh, it, when I was you, – you might have had – I don't know if they have this in Texas. They have jamborees in Texas. I know in Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah. So well, no, that's Louisiana. When I was in Louisiana, yeah. Yeah. So when I was at Northeast Louisiana, and all the high, all my teammates were talking about in high school, and they're like, "Oh, my team has their jamboree this week." I'm like, "Jamboree? What the heck's a jamboree?" And it's basically like a scrimmage, and it could be three teams that are going there, and you're going to play against each other, kind of round robin style. Um, but it was like a big event, you know, uh, to kind of kick off their their season. So I, there's ways to creatively do it. I, I just think as a fan, I'd still like to man. If I'm going to go out there to the preseason, I would like to see. Uh, some of the frontline guys, although we talked about this, uh, I've talked about this previously with Bucky, 
fascinating to me. There's no secret that the Kansas City Chiefs get rolling every year. They hit in camp. Patrick Mahomes is starting. He's going to play. They said the starter's going to play almost a half in their game this week. Josh Allen for the Bills is going to be starting this week. So some of these teams don't take the we're sitting everybody approach. uh, Those are uh, good teams, too, by the way, that have aspirations higher. They want to get out of the gate faster uh, under your – and I know, Daniel, you've got – I mean, uh, I think you do a really good job on TV on a lot of the stuff you do. I do think – I can tell you're angling for a competition committee spot right now, which is fine. I'm obviously well, do you have pull? Do you have pull there with that hat? I don't I'm know going for it. I'm going for an official's job with my hat. <laughs> you're you're trying to literally take over the competition. Hey, true story. Oh, true story. Job. Yeah, he's good. I think we'll leave Roger alone. He's he's got that thing on lockdown. Uh, the uh, this is a true story. When I was a kid, we had to read. I'm maybe sixth grade. We had to read like an autobiography uh, for a book report or whatever. And so I went to the library as people our age actually used to do uh-huh. uh, to pick out a book. I got a biography. I might be the only person who's ever read this book. God bless him. It was an autobiography of Jerry Mark Bright, uh, legendary <laughs> NFL official. I don't know. I have no idea how I stumbled upon it. I Who greenlit single- that one into, per- I don't into know how, publication? I don't know how, much, how many of those things got into circulation. But I know one thing. There's one sixth grade kid who wrote a book report on an NFL official's autobiography. Wow, was, and that was, was you. Read. It was a good read. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry Mark, Mark Bright. Bright. That's unbelievable. I'm trying to like look up the the book right. He's now. one of those guys. Like if you see him, you'll recognize him. Like you'll. Uh, oh yeah, no, I I recognize him. I'm looking for the book. See if you find. I'm it. I'm looking to see what the book is. Here it, it is. Last call. Find it? <laughs> Last call. <laughs> Memoirs of an NFL referee. That's what I read. How you long was it? it? At, <laughs> you can get it at thrift books for five dollars and seventy nine cents. <laughs> <laughs> in case you were uh or there's wait wait a minute there's also born to referee my life on the gridiron there's actually somehow mark bright has done you got two there's two different yeah there's two Can't recall different which one i got i'll be honest with you there's I do two not different ones i'm trying to see one if one of, of them looks more kid related uh give me the yeah. release date can you give me the release date on that oh let's see i'm looking for last call wait born to referee looks like the type of this looks like the cover that we would have seen. Did it look like oh, this? Oh yeah, you? yep. I, that looks familiar. That looks a little familiar to me. What year are we talking here? I'm trying to see the release date on this one, but got to be like it's got to be 80s. Got to be like this late is 80s. 1988. Yes, that's it. This is that's it. it. This is so it. I was like, yeah, I was. Uh, so I would have been like sixth grade. That it, I'm telling you, this thing was yeah. hot off the press. I jumped right on that. <laughs> I thing. mean, you were an early adapter. It's still available. Yeah. If people want to go to Amazon. They've got that there. Check that out. Check that out. Uh, all right, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back talk about some some rookie tight ends expectations. Do we see a historical year this year? Uh, we'll also get into Lance's pivotal is the word we're using, pivotal rookies uh, in each division. We'll get to that right after this. All right, Lance, uh, tight ends, rookies, we don't usually see them produce massive numbers. To give you an example on that, the record uh, that we have right now for yards by a rookie tight end is held by Mike Ditka. Uh, it's been a minute. That was 1961, and it's not like it was 1,400 yards. Ditka had 1,076 yards, 12 touchdowns. It could get in the end zone, uh, a big Mike, but uh, 1,076. Now, Kyle Pitts, I thought when he came into the league, he would destroy that. He's the, one of the highest graded tight ends I've ever evaluated. He came just short. He got 1,026 yards, only one touchdown uh, in 21, though, did not get in right. the end zone much. But as you uh, sure have been doing, I've visited camps, I've talked to people, you see clips. And we really liked this tight end group coming into the draft last year. We talked an awful lot about it. And then it looks like where we are now, we've got guys that are not only going to be contributors, they're going to be starters. And then some of them have a chance to be real key pieces here uh, for their offense. So what, what should be the reasonable expectation for the tight ends in your opinion? And is there two or three of them that, that uh, you think just based off the situation in their end, that they're equipped to have a really good year? Yeah, I really do think, well, number one, can you tell me, Who's who's the only tight end ever to win offensive rookie of the year? Eric Green. No, it's a trick question. None ever. Really? No offensive rookie of the year. No offensive lineman. Uh, no offensive lineman or tight end has ever won offensive rookie of the year ever. And the and I this know. award dates back into the uh, this the sixties. It's never happened. And uh, I like you was very high on Kyle Pitts. I was very high on this class. The deepest class that I've taken a look at. And uh, to me, your, you know, your top three, it depends on top three or four tight ends. They were all 
there was all differences to him. And I think the two that stand out to me, look, Sam Laporte, if you look over there in, in, in Detroit, there's not a lot of weapons at the tight end position right now mm-hmm. um, who automatically would play ahead of Laporta. I just think uh, Laporta, I just think Laporta has to prove he can block a little bit. I'm, I'm a little concerned about how he's going to do as a blocker. But for me, my number one tight end uh, just by a shade was Luke Musgrave for mm-hmm. all the things that people are seeing in camp, because uh, to me on tape, man, I could see it. I thought, I thought the kid was terrific. He's big, he's athletic, he can run, he can separate. I think he really translates well to the NFL. And one of the reasons I think he's got a chance to be, um, uh, you know, to maybe even approach the 900 yard mark is because I don't, I don't think these wide receivers that they have over there are great at getting wide open. And I think Jordan mm-hmm. Love, who's still kind of a rookie almost in terms of it's his first year as a full time starter, I think he wants to find the most open receivers he can find. I think a lot of these young quarterbacks uh, struggle to get used to the NFL open and what it looks like. And I think. Musgrave, the way that they're going to move him around, the way he can play inside, he can play outside, he can play in the slot. Uh, I think that he's going to be a safety blanket for Jordan Love. A lot of young quarterbacks love to find talented um, wide receivers with athleticism or tight ends with athleticism. So I think he's going to get a lot of touches over there and a lot of targets. I think Musgrave is a guy who could really see a lot of action. But to me, you're still looking at Dalton Kincaid. I mean, we know that there's been some it's it's been a little weird with uh Stefan Diggs in Buffalo. We know how incredibly talented he is. We know that the quarterback's gonna find him. But Gabe Davis has been feast or famine a little bit. And when I look at Dalton and, and you and I both know, look, you can love Cole Beasley from the slot when he was there, but this guy's a slot receiver too, with size and un mm-hmm. unbelievable hands. So it doesn't matter if you're a receiver or a tight end, you're a slot. Now he's automatic with the hands. And he could become really a guy that is hard to to match up with for defenses. I think Dalton Kincaid and Luke Musgrave are the two, for me, that have a chance to have real high impacts, more so than the normal rookies out there at the, at the position. Can I give you uh, kind of who you're reminding me of a little bit here? Just I watched the preseason for these guys. So Musgrave, he kind of reminds me of Jimmy Graham a little bit. Just how yeah. he looks. So he's so big and he runs so well. Now, I, I think that his production is going to come a couple different ways. He's going to get production on shallow crosses. They're going to get him out in the flat. They're going to get him down the seam. That's where he's going to be on the move, and he's going to be able to make things happen after the catch with his speed. Um, he's going to be able to climb on top. He's, you know, all, all That's going to be him. The difference between him and Kincaid, Kincaid is going to be able to be able to sift and sort through zones and be able to play in space and feel the game a little bit better and be able to collect, you know, maybe it's third and seven. He's going to be your option route guy. He's going to be able to do all that stuff, see the defense, identify it, feel it, separate, settle in in soft spots and zones. I think Musgrave, from an instinct standpoint, is not at you know in, in that similar vein. I think you're right. going to use his athleticism. So there's different styles of what you're going to ask these guys to do. And I think Laporta would be the third one to me. Uh, those are the three guys I'm looking for having you know really really prominent roles for their offenses. Laporta is a little bit of a mixture. He can give you a little bit of both. He can really, really run, uh, but he, I think he has a little bit of a feel in there as well. Yeah, I would agree with you. And I, and that's the thing about Kincaid for me is that whatever you want to do offensively, I think he's going to work. He's he's a wide receiver in a tight end's body in terms of mm-hmm. his his savvy with route running, his instincts as a pass catcher. Um, he is going to be more polished. Musgrave has a lot of upside and he can win with athleticism, but you're right from a polished standpoint, he's really not that close to Musgrave because he's not that clo- close to Kincaid because Kincaid played a lot more football. Musgrave yeah. hasn't played that much football up to this point. Yeah. But I am uh, bullish on the great weird. class talked of about, talked about Darnell Washington. The one thing I haven't heard much about, and I haven't seen uh, much about him as mayor. I don't know what's going on with him uh, with the Raiders. I don't know if you'd seen anything there yet at all. No, but. I haven't. You know, I considered him in my pivotal rookie um, conversation, but I'd read a little bit about mayor. He is going to try to catch up with, with all the rookies when I wrote my pivotal rookie um, article that we'll talk about in a little bit. I think mayor is uh, when you look at who's out there to catch passes, and who the quarterback is, it wouldn't surprise me if Mayor is there. I, I would think they might run a lot more too tight stuff over there for Jimmy G because I think he'll be more comfortable and a lot of too tight. So that should give Mayor a chance to, you know, be a 500 yard guy. I don't think it's going to be a massive, uh, right. a massive plus statistically, but I do think the way he blocks in the running game could really 
play a big part in helping uh, the Raiders lean on the running game to really help Garoppolo out. Because you know they you know they want to run a football. They did it well last year. You know they're going to want to do it this year. And that's something Mayor does a good job of to me is is get after uh, defensive ends and can kind of soften the edge a little bit. If I were you and I was going to be driving wearing that hat, I'm not using my blinker. I'm just using all hand signals out the window. I, I think it just goes. I think it works. I think it fits. Yeah. Just giving the first down signals. Right just up, the left I'm going <laughs> <laughs> We're make it right, turn. right turn than the, the arm yeah. out. Yeah. It's like the bicycle stuff. Yeah. Just the roll it like, down out of the window. I can't really put my arm down this way anymore because my shoulder. I mean, I'm telling you, and this has the. I mean, everything about this feels official too. Like it feels, it's kind of foamy right here. Yeah, I, I got it from the league store. I got it from the NFL the store that. that we can order from. It probably is something that the league. Can you send me you know, a link uses. by the way? Apparently, What's that? I, there's this there's this fictitious store I've heard about all these years, and I had somehow managed to never get a link to the said store. I know. Uh, I this is the first time I found it. I I didn't see that we got any kind of special codes to get big discounts. I just bought some NFL stuff that was on clearance. I'm like, yeah, let's do some early Christmas shopping for the kids. Look what daddy got from the league store. Like when you go to the mall, do you think that people think like, oh my gosh, this guy, this, I think he's an official. I think that that's why I've I wear it. it. I know I've seen him. I know I've seen him. I go in and I try to get, you know, yeah. the Annie's, uh, the pretzels things. I yeah. Try to get, yeah. I try to get discounts over there with this. Hey, how you guys doing? You guys ever watch pro football? You ever heard <laughs> of Jerry Mark, Bright? He's an author <laughs> and an official. You may know him as an author. <laughs> you look young. You've probably read about him. You I'm probably sure read Bale Wolf, sure. the Scarlet Letter, and <laughs> Referee in the memoirs of Jerry Mark Bright. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, all right. Let's get to your pivotal rookies as I'm crying. Literally, tears uh, crying yeah. here. Uh, AFC East, give me a pivotal rookie. Pivotal is a dumb word, by the way. That, well, so pivotal, to, to me, pivotal is a word that somebody that went to a state school is trying to sound smart. As someone who went from a state school, I can say that. So let me let me just say, pivotal to me, I decided to give it my own. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be the best. I think they may be the most important uh, for their team. And, and then for some teams, obviously, it means different things. Uh, and I, we already talked about Dalton Kincaid. I'm going to give you another one. I yeah. think uh, Will McDonald from the Jets. Yeah. When you look at the Jets, um, you could come up with a couple of different guys here on this one. Joe Tipman could end up being the pivotal rookie if he wins a starting position. Yeah. But rushing the passer is something that they've really wanted to get better at in New York for a long time. And I think Will McDonald, who's going to be a wave rusher, he's not going to be – he's not a guy that's going to be setting edges and stopping a run on first down. But to me, the Jets have a chance to really – we know they can shut down one side of the field with Sauce Gardner. I think Will Anderson is just a pin-the-years-back-and-go type of pass rusher. McDonald. He, I mean, Will Will McDonald, if he can – he's bendy, he's flexible, he's got a great inside spin. I think his ability to assail the pocket is really, quote-unquote, pivotal for the Jets' potential – to win the division they've got to get a rush they've got to get a better rush and that guy has some real ability he has translatable nfl traits i think to get into the pocket early on yeah i mean think about it from a baseball standpoint the jets every game is going to be a bullpen game where yeah. you don't you don't need guys to give you six innings you're going to just roll guys out there and say two innings give me everything you got so if you throw normally you throw 93 94 over six seven innings you're gonna be throwing 97 98 because you're only gonna have to play two innings we yeah. got so many guys, we're going to keep all you guys fresh, just rolling, 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 rolling. And guess what? Whoever lines up next to Quinn and Williams, you're getting one-on-ones. You're not yeah. You're not going to ever see a double with him there. So it's going to be a feast on the outside. They've got, gosh, they've got six ends they can roll through there. Yeah, I think he's got defensive rookie of the year potential. He's kind of a long shot because he won't play every down. He's going to know, but he's going to, he's going to have, you know what he's going to have? He's going to have like nine sacks on, in like 20 tackles. Like he's just going to yeah. have like Houston, like Houston had last year in Detroit. Uh, if you look up James Houston's and look how they used him. Yeah, that's yeah. probably that might be the blueprint here early on as he's getting his feet wet. I think so. I think so, especially for a player his size. He's a little lighter, but he's tough and and he has skill as a rusher. I go to the AFC North now, and I'm gonna look at the Bengals. I went DJ Turner. The reason I went DJ Turner in this one, he's the the cornerback from Michigan, is one of the things we saw at Kansas City, and they aspire to be Kansas City, right? To be the man, you got to beat the yeah. man. 
one of the things we saw at Kansas City is rookie cornerbacks, having depth at the cornerback position is extremely important. And if you can play in the slot and play outside, which I think Turner has the ability to do because of his speed and his short area route matching. I think that that gives him that much more value. And if there's any injuries at all, Turner to me is one of those keys for a team that has aspirations of winning a Super Bowl. You need to have guys in the secondary that can play. And so whether he plays well or doesn't play well, that's why I think he could be the pivotal Bengal because you you're going to be facing Kansas City, right? You may be facing uh, the Chargers. You may be facing the 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 Bills or the the Dolphins. There's a ton of offense in the AFC, and so having depth at cornerback and guy a guy who can play inside or outside to me is extremely valuable, and that's why I thought he was pivotal in that particular instance. All right, I need you to check the chat here on the video, and I'm just going to let you know that um, that's an interesting call, uh, but I'd like to challenge. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. We have a challenge. Uh, do I need to look into the booth? Do I need yeah. to? Do I need to look in the booth? Who? Okay, Daniel Jeremiah is challenging the call on the field. Okay, <laughs> who do you think is the most pivotal? No, I just, I just, just wanted, want me to challenge. I just, wanted, I just wanted to hear you say with that hat on. The previous opinion is under review. The previous opinion is under review. <laughs> and then I can do this. If I something I can put it over my head and look into the way they used to look into it. Uh, <laughs> You always get a theme. It was old Houston Rockets the last yeah. time I was up from the yeah. senior bowl. Uh, Jerry Mark There's always Wright. a theme that develops with Jerry Mark Wright's Wright. name is not in the description of this episode. Then Nabil, we have failed as a podcast. Uh, you have failed miserably. And people read it like, how did Mark Bright come up on this show? <laughs> uh, uh, AFC South. You. What we got? I've got one for you. Uh, Houston Texans. You know, I said Stroud and Anderson, they're going to have their ups and downs. Oh, hanging fruit. It's a low-hanging fruit indeed. Tank Dell, if he plays well or doesn't play well, I'll have I an, drafted him in a fantasy league, by the way. I, I love Tank Dell. I think yeah. Tank Dell's not guardable. He wasn't guardable in the season. He wasn't guardable, guardable at the senior role. He's not going to be guardable now. But I think no. Juice Scruggs is the most pivotal, and here's why. He's going to step in a rookie into the center position. If he plays well in an outside zone-based scheme with, with Bobby Slowick, it can have a big – it can be a big, big deal. I mean, rookies need to be smart, and by all accounts, he is – an intelligent and high character football guy, Juice Scruggs. But being able to protect the passer, uh, Kenyon Green was a mess last year at left guard. So if he's starting there at left guard this year and you get a rookie at center, you know, Juice Scruggs is really going to have to play well for that offense to reach even its potential right now with the rookie quarterback. And CJ Stroud, they've invested a lot in CJ Stroud. They really need him to to start his 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 career off with a, a, a certain level of confidence and so i think from a pivotal standpoint having juice scruggs the center from penn state who i thought was overdrafted a little bit but i still like him a lot um and you know just like i do that was a name that was really hot with a lot of teams everyone seemed to really like juice scruggs i think that uh, i think he's going to be pivotal for the texans having a a rookie who plays intelligently and consistently as a run blocker and pass blocker it, that's big when you have a rookie quarterback. Yep, I like that one. Uh, how about the AFC West? AFC West, uh, I will give you. Well, uh, okay, let's. I'll let you get into it a little bit. I went Quentin Johnston. I didn't okay. really think there was another one with the Chargers, but you tell me if there's someone else that you would point to. But for me, it's really about adding that that next weapon. If you want to, you're going to have to outscore. A team at some point you're going to have to just put a big number up and I think Johnston he has some things he has to prove a little bit but I think Quentin Johnston's ability to uh, I think his ability to uh, to get down the field when he needs to and his his run after catch stuff to me that's a really really big deal for the Chargers and could really add some juice to an offense it's starting to me a little bit long in the tooth from a wide receiver standpoint. So um, I didn't know your thought, uh, thoughts on Quentin yeah. Johnston or any other rookie out there that you think is a pivotal rookie. Yeah, I mean, look, early returns have been really positive. I've been out there for three practices. I've been uh, obviously called the, the preseason game. Now, Quentin dropped a couple balls in the first preseason game, and then he was out of the game, and you're thinking, oh, gosh, this is going to end up being a storyline. You know, it's a question it's about his hands. And then they got him back in for one play uh, in the second quarter, and it, he's in the slot. 
shows you some some big time twitch and separation catches a touchdown and it kind of changed the narrative coming out of that game my thing on him is live with some of the drops like oh don't be shocked don't be surprised don't even be upset about it he's going to have some drops but he's yep. going to be able to offset those uh with big plays down the field which is his role that's what his role is going to be but i would tell you lance like scott matlock if he doesn't start he's going to get a lot of minutes here uh the wow defense well he was a, he's an impressive drop. physical specimen i mean yes. he, he really jumped out on tape that's that's Tested impressive like three, where was six, he drafted four, 300 six round yeah this is a, and this is on the heels of last year getting sawyer in that round so they've kind of you know found a little something here uh in the trenches late in the draft and then Tui Pelotu is going to be the third end. He's going to play a lot. He'll be a, he's going to be really helpful, especially on rundowns. It's odd to say for a guy who led the nation in sacks, but heavy-handed point of attack is probably going to be his calling card early in the early in the uh, part of his career. And then Darius Davis, who had a, a punt return for a touchdown the other day, is going to be their returner. So he'll have Tui Pelotu. What's he playing at? What kind of weight is he playing? I at think right he's now? probably two sixty-five to two seventy. That's a good weight. Yeah. He'll be very yeah. physical, and he's really. He's a really good athlete as well. Has really good feet. I think the way he plays. Um, NFC North. I went Darnell Wright with the Bears. I mean, look, Terrell Smith. I reached out and, and to Bear Contact and was asking about the corners. And Terrell Smith, who's banged up right now, and Ty Tyreek Stevenson are both playing really, really well when they've been mm -hmm. out there. So I do think that corner position is important. But you've got so much hanging in the balance with with your quarterback right now with Justin Fields. Darnell Wright's ability to play at a reasonably high level, to play, I think, above average, could have an impact on the Bears making one of the biggest jumps in, in pro football this year. I really I really think with some of the moves that they've made and some of the draft picks they have, if Darnell Wright plays well, that could, be a, that could have a really big impact on Justin Fields' future and the consistency of the Bears' offense. Um, I would say real quick that on, yeah. on those guys, on Stevenson uh, specifically, because for those who don't know, Lance and I talk darn near every day as we get into the spring. Like we are talking about these these players we're studying for the draft. It's really, it's really, it's great. Matlock came up. Scott Matlock yeah. came up late yeah. in the conversation. He did. Him. He did. He did. But Tyreek Stevenson, I don't remember, remember this conversation, but to me, like the kind of like the sneaky glue ingredient for corners when you self-evaluate, look at guys that, that I, I look at guys I've missed on, look at guys that I've been able to hit on. Over the last five years, I would say specifically, because of what these offensive coordinators have done to pull corners into run support, that toughness is non-negotiable. And if you look at the guys who have flamed out, usually that's a trait that they're missing. And you look at the guys who have overachieved, Usually that's a strength for them is their toughness. And Tyreek Stevenson was a bad dude, man. He was so tough and tough. so competitive. You can nitpick this or that, but at the end of the day, and you've got some size and speed and you are incredibly competitive and tough, like that's the guy you, you bet on. And it's not a surprise that he's off to a really good start. No, and it's not just that, but the toughness manifests itself in terms of competitive catch situations. I mean, mm -hmm. you're not a tough guy in one area, but then not tough in the other. If you're tough, you're tough. It's just a matter of physically if you can hold up. And he's he's got the build for it. So does Terrell Smith. I, I, I remember I remember sending you a clip of that. Of, I don't remember. I think it was uh, the Florida State game where at, he had been so in this receiver's head that eventually the receiver just snapped. And you see him trying to punch him and hit him in the face and all yeah. that stuff. And I'm like, I think he broke him, Lance. I think Stevenson broke this dude. And he's a press man corner who is – yeah, the only issues he has to me are he's not a zone corner. You don't want to put him in zone situations. He had some real issues. But if you get a press – if he gets to press and stay in your pocket – He's going to be tough. And I remember talking to Alonzo Highsmith, who's a, the GM over with the, the Miami Hurricanes for uh, Mario Cristobal. And, and Zoe and I were talking about him a little bit. He said, he's tough. Like, he's going to be he's going to be a good NFL player. You know, Alonzo Highsmith has had that job in the NFL evaluation, you yeah. know, front office guy. Zoe, Zoe is uh, one of the toughest human beings that's ever put on cleats. Too, ever, so. ever. Yeah. And he loved this kid's toughness, too. And he knows fake tough. And Tyreek Stevenson is not fake tough, not not yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. So he could end up being, listen, he could end up being one of the pivotal rookies. Frankly, I think two or three could be for the Bears. Uh, moving yeah. to the AFC South, it was kind of, you know, Bijan Robinson, South, right? yeah. Bryce yeah. Young, Brian Breesey were all the guys. But I said Cody Mock for the Bucks because and Kalijah Kansi, I think, is going to be a good player. But they really need to get that offense back on track. And I think Mock's transition from tackle to guard and learning to play against higher level of competition is going to be quote unquote pivotal for whether or not Baker Mayfield or whoever ends up at quarterback 
can get on track enough for that offense to matter this year. The offense was was not good last year. And so I think Cody Mock is kind of pivotal in that regard. I Learning to play, the, it's a hard transition to make, but if he can make it, it's not a tough, super tough division, I don't think. You know, the Bucks. maybe the Bucks can be a little better than people think if he can play well. I like that. Um, by the way, if you uh, if Kyle Trask ends up getting that job, I mean, what do we uh, we going with Kyle's kids? Like, what do we? What's that section of the stadium where we have like the uh, the Trask fan club? What are we calling that thing? I like I like Kyle's kids. That's not bad. Uh, Kyle smiles where he does a dental thing where oh, kids get nice. braces. Yes. Yeah, every they, touchdown teeth, a kid gets a crown on his teeth whitening as well as we do <laughs> help. You know, with people that can't afford dental care, we get them proper dental care. That's right. I like, I like, that. I like that. And maybe we can get, you know, maybe Tampa can get an advertiser in and bring a little money into it. So we can, we're also generating revenue for the bucks. So you're welcome. Maybe, maybe, maybe he sells organizers that get donated <laughs> for charity and they keep you on Trask instead of uh, on Keep task. you on Trask. I like that. I yeah. like that. That's a good um, one too. You're king right, of the yeah. puns. Yeah, there we go. NFC West. NFC West, uh, I think the one that would make the most sense, the one that has the biggest impact here would be it's it's a it's a first rounder and it's Jackson Smith and Jigba. Now, I do want to also mention Jake Moody as a kicker for the 49ers. I think that is worth looking at because you just had a very consistent Robbie Gold that you parted ways with. And now you're going to have a rookie kicker coming in. DJ, you know, like I do, the amount of pressure that is on a kicker is immense as we get late in the season. 49ers have high, high hopes. A rookie kicker, I know it kind of falls under the the radar, but I think Jake Moody with the 49ers could end up being a very pivotal player like a lot of kickers could. But Jackson Smith and Jigba with Seattle. So DK is a certain kind of – he's kind of a niche receiver, right, in terms of the routes he's going to run. And then you've got – You've got a guy who's kind of a, a, jit, a jitterbug wide receiver who can do a lot of different things with in uh, uh over with uh, Tyler Lockett. Yeah, Tyler Lockett. Now you put a bigger guy with great hands who can run possession routes, and that's that third piece of the puzzle. Bucky always talks about the basketball team at wide receiver. Now Geno Smith has that basketball team at wide receiver. Truly, three different types of wide receivers. You know, people kind of sleep on 31 touchdowns, 10 interceptions was the year that Geno had last year. He had a really good year. Is there a chance you look at what's going on at quarterback with, with San Francisco? Could it be a little unsettled? We'll see. I mean, if Purdy plays like he did last year, they're fine. But can he? We'll find out. Um, don't like Arizona much. Rams, we've got to see what the Rams are going to do. Is there any reason to believe that a team that had nine wins and surprised people last year can't get even better offensively and maybe make a little bit more noise and become a 10 win season this year. I think, I think, I think Jackson Smith and Jigba really helps that offense go from being a good offense to a very good offense quickly. Just trying to see as we get to the, uh, to the end of the episode, can you just give me one of these? Can we just get time out? Yeah. We'll just give you a time out right there. Just gave the time out. We're on sportsman. Yeah. There we go. Uh, Golly, Lance! It's, I mean, it is amazing. That is a that is a good hat. You it, need it is a great hat. hat. It's a great hat. Um, all right, that's great stuff. Again, you can find the rest of the list. Lance did this for all thirty-two teams. Again, pivotal, 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 pivotal rookies that uh, we've got. One for every team. You can find that on NFL.com. What else are you working on, man? What else can I plug for you here? No, that's right now. That's it. Um, I'm just getting ready to. I'm getting my my scouting list together. I'm putting my names together for who I'm going to be looking up and. So I'm just going to get ready to start taking an early look at some of the players, writing some, you know, just some early ideas about who players are physically, what they are, and start to to gather my ideas. I like to I like to take it easy. I like to take it easy after the draft's done. I go in cruise control a little bit now. So I just come on for the only thing I do is I do youth football games, obviously referee. Um, I will do some baseball World Series watching, obviously, because of the Astros uh, every no, single I'll year. Yeah. And then, by the way, how's it going with Juan Soto? I hear he's having some problems with some of his teammates. Is everything okay? Um, it hasn't been great. With your the, Saudi uh, oil money that you have there in San Diego, so we're, hey, were, were you able we're to buy the it. team you wanted? So somehow we're still in it. I don't know how, but we're four and a half back. We just need a nice little win streak here. We play a lot of teams that are ahead of us. Yeah, so we're not done yet. Here's my one. Here's my one homework assignment for you. So because of your your status with NFL media, right. 
yeah. you can get credentials to college games. So you, yes. as, a, as a media member, you can be a credentialed media member. So here's your assignment. I want you to go to uh, like a University of Houston game. I want you yeah. to get a notepad, like a, a, a like a notepad like this. I want you to wear that hat, yep. and I want you to follow the college officials around during pregame and just <laughs> act like you're act like you're taking notes. These guys are gonna think that the NFL is scouting them. That they, if they have a good game today, they're that's moving so up, baby. We are moving up. Just just that's around. so like, good. Oh, ooh, yeah, and yeah, then I can just say, good. "Hey, what's your name?" <laughs> <laughs> hey, 27, 27, side judge. Uh, Bill, is it Bill? No, it's uh, Steve. All right, thanks, Steve. With this hat too, after a bang bang call, the f the call on the field has been overturned. First down, <laughs> University of Houston. Hey, hey, what's what's your name? What's your last name? Uh, the guy who just had his call overturned. <laughs> I knew you'd have something in the show. But you, see, everybody will know you in Houston, so you almost need to go somewhere where they don't know you, and uh, and then just go there and just sit up in the press box with the hat on. And then when there's a, like, say there's a holding pill, just go. Ah, oh, dang it, Billy! Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. I de it's the same stuff I deal with all the time here. <laughs> Dad, gum it! I'm gonna have to make a call to the office. This is not oh, good. Oh gosh, that's so good. Well, there goes his week. Well, hey, or or, or 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 get somebody to video you while you're on the sideline, and if you <laughs> if you just go to the official and go, hey, like your uh, your pants, hey, you got pull them up, you got, hey, pull them up a little bit, <laughs> and just see if they think you're some kind of an authority figure with that hat on, and see if they do it. That's right, that's right. The officials like, uh, hey, you guys have uh, dress code too. We got to be on, we got to be in code, guys. We Come on, be man. Code. Come on now. I like it. There's a lot of things I can do with this hat. We'll see if I can get uh, a speeding ticket with it. Uh, yeah, well, that's not going to happen. Um, all right. Again, to summarize, uh, Lance's Pivotal Rookies, NFL.com. Find it. Jerry Mark writes book on being an official. Go get that thing. Get four ninety nine. Yeah. Is that where? Is that what it's running right now? Five ninety nine at thrift at uh, Thrifty Books. Five ninety nine Thrifty Books. You won't regret it. At least that's what uh, fourteen year old me or thirteen year old me, whatever it was, read that book. Thought it was amazing. So, and I I don't know where the report is, but I'm sure that I'm sure that like I guess maybe yeah, sixth grade, so twelve years old. 12 years old, you know, the people they're, they're getting like, you know, these reports on, uh, you know, George Washington and Jackie Robinson. And the teacher's like, Jerry, what is this? Jerry Mark Bright. Was he in the American Revolution? I don't remember reading about him being with the founding fathers. Yeah. Well, he wasn't founding fathers, but he was one of the very first. Jefferson to, uh, Adams actually, Mark Bright. That he was, was one of the very three. first ones that didn't have to do the pull down on the holding. He would just grab the wrist. For a holding, he didn't do the full pulling down of the wrist. He just grabbed it, and it was still a holding call. Jerry started that. Yeah, what a book. Um, all right. Anyways, this was fun today, Lance. Thanks for for filling in for us. We've got, you got Bucky. It, I'm sure we'll be back next week. You're the best, buddy. Appreciate all you. Right, we'll see you guys. All right. We'll see you next time right here on Move the Sticks.